And so when people heard this back then, when they heard this, the Bible says they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And after they prayed, the place in which they were gathered shook. Mm, can you imagine that? It says the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. Now, I personally have witnessed the Holy Spirit move through Pleasant Grove. Others of you might be able to piggyback on my testimony. I'm just going to give you mine because it don't happen frequently in the way I experienced it. But at that time, the building shook, but it really didn't shake. So you might ask me, did the building shake, Jackie? No, it did not. Did the preacher keep preaching? No, he did not. Did the people begin to speak in tongues boldly? No, they did not. Did the choir sing out? No, they did not. Well, then what happened, Jackie? I'll tell you what happened. Without form or fashion, the church became eerily quiet to the point that all you could hear was sniffles and every now and then somebody would yell out hallelujah. Somebody else would just call the name of Jesus. And it went on for several minutes. And when it stopped and it was all over, people looked at each other as though to say, what just happened? And that's the same thing that happened here in this church. Well, what happened was in this instance, in the story we're talking about today, the people were all on one accord. That's what happened in the experience I had. The people were in all accord. What was we in what? I don't know. I only know the Holy Spirit visited that church in a way I hadn't seen it before. The preacher was preaching. The preacher stopped. The Holy Spirit had his way that day. The people were all on one accord. That's what happened here in that first century church. Now, how large or small was that congregation? Don't know, doesn't matter. But this is what we need to know. We would be wise to, it does not take a lot of people to do nothing or to depend on others to do God's work. But it does take our believers who are united in their love for God. They need to be of one heart, okay? So when we stand together as one in the body of Christ, we're acting out who he is in our life. We always say he's our provider. He's our sustainer. He's our strong tower. There's nothing the church body cannot accomplish. Ha! Huh. When we lean on God and we love on God, you can't love on God unless we love on each other, okay? Because we are then we find ourselves, it's then we find ourselves in his favor and he enables us to meet the needs of other people, particularly within the church family. You know what they say, it's good to help other people, but you need to help home first. So Christians need to build themselves up in Christ. And then we're better equipped to help people on the outside. Why? Because love sharing is the will of God. Any comments? So we're going to talk about these people's generosity back in those days when the new church was being formed. Um, so let me ask you a question really quick. How does exercising generosity show our devotion and love for the Lord? Now, remember, it says here, uh, the believers were in one heart. No one claimed any of their possessions as their own, but they shared everything they had. So tell me, how does exercising generosity show devotion and love for the Lord? Jackie, I believe it does uh, because it's selfless, which uh, mirrors Christ's mindset, Christ's spirit, Christ's behavior. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Okay. So yeah. So show 
when we're showing love one for another, we're actually showing our love for God also. That's just a, a very important thing that we ought to remember. The church is purposed, and I hope I hope you will agree with me when I say this. The church is purposed to share wealth so that no one is poverty stricken. Now, you can go back and you can read Acts chapter two and filter that out. So neither the people of the first century church or the 21st century church of today are required to give away all our, that's not what God's asking of us. That's not what our church leaders are asking of us to give away everything we have in order to prove our love for Jesus Christ and for each other. No, that's not it. But we are to give generously to provide for those in need. Okay, so this has always been God's goal for the people of God, not for the people of the world, but for the people of God. You see, when we pick up to follow Jesus Christ, we have to become a selfless people, as Sister Philonese just shared with us. We have to learn to become selfless and not selfish. If God has blessed you with plenty, then you ought to be generous in what he has given you. Uh, not to the point of hurting you or family. It's just something that develops in your heart. It becomes a natural thing when we have that type of relationship with Christ. So we're supposed to give to those who are in need. Um, guess what? This law was given way back in Deuteronomy chapter 15. So you can read for that for yourself. But it says, however, there need not be poor people among you because in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance. He will richly bless you. Now you're saying, well, he hasn't given me any land if you're sitting in pleasant grove baptist church as a member if you're sitting in any other church local church as a member of that body you are partaking in that inheritance of that church pleasant grove Twenty-five years old. Anybody who puts in their worships on a regular basis is participating in an inheritance that God has given us for one hundred and twenty-five years. Somebody ought to shout about that. This is an exciting thing. And so, if the word was good for the first church, God's word in that regard, then it's still good for us today because God doesn't change. We're living our inheritance. That's a beautiful thing. And so, here's a key truth for us. Believers show love and devotion to God when they show love to each other. That's what we're doing. We're not trying to show off or anything. We're just showing love one to the other, making sure that each other is well taken care of. Verses 43 through um, uh, 33 through 35. I'm going to read those. I should tell you too that I, I forget to tell you this always in the beginning, but um, I took my, I studied from the NIV. So here it says, number 33, with great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's grace, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, in all of them, that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and they brought the money from the cells and they put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The food lines are, are huge. And the, anybody can go into these food lines, is my understanding, and claim a sack of food or basket of food or box of food, whatever it is they have, without question. Huh. So the only question I would propose is, do you really need it? Or can you leave it for the person behind you who might need it more so than you? But the fact is, if the people giving it away are giving it away with a clean heart and the people who are receiving it are receiving it in honest need, it's all a good thing. So right here, what we're seeing is these people are have been so blessed, see, by God's grace that 
they are experiencing no distractions. What they are experiencing is God's favor. That's what they are experiencing here. It says there's no needy persons among them. Okay, and they left it up to the apostles to distribute it the way it needed to be uh, distributed. Hmm. So here's the thing. No needy among them because by God's grace, no matter what personal situation the people may have been going through, what, what their situation looked like, every member being on the same page, being in one accord, viewed his glass, if you will, as being half empty. Huh. And so the Holy Spirit now moved in the hearts of those who had land and who had houses. The Holy Spirit moved in the heart of those who had houses and had land, okay? And that's how come they sold it. The power of the Holy Spirit. Were they fearful of having to give it up? No, they weren't fearful. Did they think they were being cheated? No, they didn't think, no. They knew they were rich in the favor of God. And if God gave it to them once, he'll give it to them again. This is the God we serve. As they believed, each person gave their best. They gave their best because they knew God would take care of the rest of it. So today's church, we need to understand that same thing. We, we need to live out the words we sing and we need to be careful what we sing. We're always singing, the more you give, the more you give. We need to be sure our hearts are bound in Christian love when we sing those words, right? The more you give, the, the more, more you give, give you need to be careful when we say you can't beat God's giving no matter how you try. Why do I say that? Because if we're not careful when we sing, you can't beat God's giving. You keep on giving because it's true. You can't. You're putting that off on somebody else. We don't always recognize that as we say it, but subconsciously, a lot of times that's what's taking place there, right? Perhaps we need to change those words. And in the privacy of our own space, building, the more we give, the more God gives back to us, okay? Because now you have personalized it. You are taking accountability. You are testifying to the goodness of God and your faith continues to grow stronger. I'm so sorry, but I just pulled tonight. And, uh, There's no need to apologize. It's all good. It's yes, all good. it is. This got me up. Got me. Anyway, so I know the words and songs always sound good to us, but we really need to understand why we're saying them and do we really mean it? Do we take it to heart? Oh, my Lord. And so, anyway. When members are together in heart and spirit, it's this oneness we feel with each other. That part of our collective effort, okay? When we come together, God's in the middle of it. When we come together, we're placing him in the middle of our collective effort of whatever it is we're trying to effect for the good of his people and God is so awesome that when the church comes together like this and agrees to stand up according to his word for the purpose of carrying out his word he's big enough and he's full of grace enough to bless that church body collectively as well as bless the individual members his grace is a gift that he gives to his people to strengthen them and to help them to carry on and fulfill that which he has asked the church to do. Hmm. He works through our willingness to serve and he blesses us as we show love one to another. I got another question for you. 
and uh, it's, it's personal. How could you improve your role in meeting the needs of the church? And I'm not asking you to speak out. I'm asking you to consider that in your private time, in your private space. We're looking at verses 36 and 37 of chapter four. We're talking about a character here now that's being introduced to us by the name of Barnabas. And it says in 37 that he sold a field he owned and brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now, what's the significance of introducing this Barnabas to us, you think? Well, sometimes we have to do a little research. Does anybody know what the name Barnabas means? An interpretation of that name, Barnabas? I think, I think it means encouragement, if Thank I remember correctly. <laughs> Thank you. Son uh -huh. of encouragement indeed, Barnabas. That's why he's being introduced to us in this lesson, okay? So, whew. Barnabas was an encourager and it was reflected in his character in the way he spoke in the way he, and because of his mannerism and his good character, he drew the respect of all the people and they trusted him. And so he led by example. And you know, uh, he, uh, President elect President Biden, President elect Biden, I get those terms mixed up. Anyway, he said something the other night that caught my attention. He says, it's not the, the United States, it's not so much the power of, our example, our example, but it's the example of our power. That is our power. In other words, I understood at the time what he was trying to say. People lead according to how they're being led. And it's powerful, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. Now we've seen what negative examples can do to a country in this uh -huh, last yeah. administration we've had. And yeah, so, absolutely. yes, it's just very, very important to understand. So anyway, Barnabas is an encourager. We've got some things going on here in the church, but now we've been introduced to this man who's trustworthy. He's from the tribe of Levi. We know that that's a priestly tribe, right? And we know that later on in the uh, gospels, he teams up with the apostle Paul and they become missionaries together. They become close companions, one with the other. And so he serves as an example of those who own land and sold it to raise money, not for himself, but for the care of the needy in the congregation. He acted up front in an upfront, transparent manner. And he gave without any anything in return. Any comments or questions? Jackie, um, mm -hmm. this lesson reminds me of something that Pastor has shared. A matter of fact, he said it a couple of times that we, he said, we bring our tithes and offering that together, then we will be able to share with someone that are in need and also take care of the church itself. That's right. That's right. And I believe that is true. You know, it's, it's, it's not so much that, uh, you know, perhaps maybe we innocently take too much responsibility in our minds. Well, I don't have a lot to give, so I'm not going to give. It's not about how much you're putting in there so much as it is, are you giving it freely? Are you giving it out of love? And when you put it with everybody else, it's just like Thanksgiving dinner, you know? Everybody bring a little something. Look how much food we got. If only one person tries to prepare it all, you may not have as much. But when everybody brings in a little bit of something, you got this huge buffet to eat from. It's, you know, I mean, the more people, 
then the more we can have. And so thank you for sharing that. Well, I summarized those verses uh, 42, uh, 32 through 37 by saying this. It is the name of Jesus Christ. And it's the faith that comes through we, the believers, that invites God to search our hearts. Search our hearts. And when our motives line up with God's will and purpose, he moves on behalf of the believers to affect good. That's how I'm going to summarize all that up. It's in the name of Jesus and through the faith of the believers that good comes out of our sharing love one with the other. Division two, now we're going to talk about the opposite of uh, what we just studied about Barnabas giving up his land and the other people who sold their property. Now we're going to talk about somebody who takes the opposite uh, uh, role in, in, in giving. And this is about a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Now I call it a study in, in hypocrisy. <laughs> We're now looking at chapter five, verses one through 11. It starts out, it says, a man named Ananias together with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I'm gonna ask you right now, how did Ananias and Sapphira different from what Barnabas did? What was different? Well, when um, I was reading, I was struck by Barnabas's, when it talked about laying it at their feet, that's an act of, submission humility um so with him and um it, it was done through humility okay ananias okay. ananias and sapphira they did the outward act but the heart was wicked the heart was dark it was deceptive it was hypocritical so while they looked the okay. same way so they laid it down the same Go ahead. Yes. No, you go ahead. Oh, <laughs> no, I was just saying while the acts looked the same. Yeah. Um, there's a scripture that says that man looks at the outward part, but God looks at the heart. Um, they're, they, they were exposed and didn't know they were exposed. Yeah, they, that's, a, that's the thing. They didn't know it. They yeah. didn't know it. So, so be careful. That's for us. Be careful. You know, we, we sin and we don't know it sometimes. Be careful. So see, this couple were doing things in opposition to the way Barnabas did things. So when we first look at what they did, it says that uh, they sold their property and, and they uh, kept back part of the money for themselves and they brought the rest to their pocket. And we say, oh, that is, they weren't right. Well, why do we say that? So immediately, they wrong for doing that. You know why we say that's wrong? Because we saw up here in the front where it said, in the earlier scriptures where it said people were selling their property and Barnabas was one of those people. He sold his property, he brought 100% and gave it to the apostles. Well, apparently he could afford it. We don't need to be judging this couple because they sold their property. They had a right to sell it and to make a profit. They had a right not to give 100%. That's not what the sin was. And you see, that's what we need to be careful of. That's not what the sin was. Now, I agree that they had a dark heart and stuff, but they allowed themselves to be tempted by Satan and they didn't even know it. See, Sister Phil and he said, they didn't even know. They were tempted. Satan's always throwing them fiery darts at us in their mind. Reverend Rosser, if I remember right, Sunday when he gave his sermon was talking about when we get caught in Satan's trap, we're, uh, Satan's bait, when we're taken in by his bait, we're subject to sin and we don't even always recognize it. It's not something to be afraid of, it's something to be aware of and, and try not to allow that to happen to ourselves. But that's mm -hmm. what happened here with these people. And so in verse, uh, verses three and four, Peter says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit 
and you've kept for yourself a sum of money that you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Woo! So I ask you, how were they deceived by Satan? How was Eve deceived in the Garden of Eden by Satan? How was she deceived? What was said to her? Well, at, you, you, you know, and Reverend Rosser said it again Sunday, when you fall for that line, did God really mean that? Or surely God, you know, a lot of times in our mind we'll say, oh, well, you know, I don't think God is paying attention or God cares if I do this or something like that. That's, that's the fiery darts of Satan being thrown at us. And so the decision that Ananias and Sapphira to sell their property, again, I say it wasn't wrong. Giving less than 100% for distribution among the needy, that wasn't wrong either. What was wrong was their deliberate misrepresentation of what they did, a lie. And the thing about it is uh, the plot to deceive the disciples blew up in their face because the Holy Spirit and God knew they were lying. Somehow, even Peter knew they was lying through the power of the Holy Spirit in Peter because he confronted him immediately. And he asked him, well, look, he says, wasn't it yours to begin with? It was always your land. You chose to sell it. And when you sold it, the money you got from it, wasn't it your decision to do with that money as you please? So why are you lying about what you did with your money? You're giving us the impression that you gave us 100%, but you didn't. Why are you giving us the impression that you gave us 100% when you know you didn't do that? So what this raises is the question, what was behind their motive for uh, bringing the monies in only partly and not giving the all. What was they after? It's like Sister Philony says, it was all about appearances and they were appearing to be more generous than they really were. And uh, if they just told the truth, they could have showed the people what true generosity looks like. But to lie to men is bad. Peter picked up on that, he didn't like it. But the light of the Holy Spirit is worth. And all he had placed at Peter's feet was only part of the sale. And like I said, for some in some way, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter knew that they were holding back for the wrong reasons. Now, so I'm going to ask y'all a question. Because I want to make sure we all understand what's being said. What words could Ananias have used to give an honest accounting of the sale? What, what could he have said differently that would not have uh, tagged them as being liars and being deceitful? How would you, if, 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 if you, okay, if you had a piece of property, just, just make, it, make it your story. You got a piece of property, you want to go sell it. And you're successful at that. Now, you made the decision to sell the property. Nobody forced you to. The church didn't ask you to sell it. You made that decision. That's okay. You had a selling price. You got all the money you wanted. And you said, I'm going to do a good thing. And I'm going to give it to the church. But you didn't give it all to the church. But you saw Barnabas over here do it. And you saw how the people praised Barnabas. And you thought, I want some of that praise. I think that's what was going on with Ananias and his wife. So in order to avoid that false impression being given and that lying and that deceitfulness, if it were you, how would you have presented your money to them? What words could you have chosen? Jackie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would just come out and say that I'm not giving you everything that I got from the property. And that yeah. way, 
you know, <laughs> you'll be in the clear. You won't be lying. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Because you know what? That, and that's exactly what I was hoping someone would say. Just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. He could have said something like, well, you know, we sold the land, but because of our financial situation, we can only give you half the full profit or whatever it is. You know, by them doing this, guess what? They're being selfless. How? Because now they're encouraging other people who may have even less than they have, encouraging them to take that bold step of giving what they can without feeling like they're not giving enough. Tell the truth. The truth will always win out. So they made the mistake of lying. And that's what uh, uh, happened to them. Huh, but by misrepresenting the proceeds, as being all, okay, when it was only part, they committed moral fraud. That's what they did. They committed moral fraud. <laughs> Peter didn't bite his tongue when he came at uh, Ananias, when we read that. He just asked him flat out about the whole situation. Ananias lied. Here's a key truth. God always knows the truth, and he'll never be fooled by human deception. He always knows the truth. Don't try to fool him. Got a question for you. Does this lesson cause you to rethink your own giving pattern? You may or may not want to answer that out loud, and that's okay, but you need to think about that too. We're yeah. moving on. Versus, yeah. Did someone want to say something? Yeah, me. Yes, go ahead. I was just thinking, and this is my first time ever thinking this, I almost hate to hate you brought it up, but it's this. Uh, you know, sometimes we get our checks in the mail, right? Right. And he wants the first off of the top, right? Right. Sometimes we get extra money. Right. We may get a check from here, a check from there, a money come in, some kind of way that we get. And and I'm sitting here thinking, if he wants the first fruit of all of the money, why don't I give him the first fruit? This extra money. Yes. Sometimes we get a little money back from, from uh, taxes or something. And I never think about giving God. I say, well, this is free money. Yes. <laughs> but now <laughs> come up. Yeah. I'm going to have a little talk with Jesus about this. All right. All right. Thank you so I, much. No, but I thank God for this, though, because he's just bringing this to me. Is yes. that I don't give him the top off of all of all the money that I receive. Mm -hmm. But now he's putting it in me, so we're going to talk about it. it. And it won't be a long talk. So <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, and that's the thing. And, and thank you for, for uh, being transparent about that because a lot of us, I'm sure, fall in that same category. And you know, we don't want to admit that. But you're doing what Ananias and his wife could have done just tell the truth. Uh, and because now that Sister Yvonne has told the truth, the yeah. rest of us can sit and think and say, I need to have a little talk with Jesus. Because uh, guess what? When I get that little extra, I don't think about putting it in church. Uh, but guess what? If he gave you extra this time, there ain't nothing stopping God from giving you extra in the future. That's the God we serve. That's how big he is. That's how awesome he is. Yeah. Okay? That's how generous he is. That's just who he is. We need to be more like him. So we're going to move right on before we run out of time. So when Ananias heard Peter question him like this, he fell down and he died because Peter told him, you know, you're, you're going to die, man, right now. And the fear seized everybody who heard what happened. And then some guys came in, they took him away and they buried him. So he was being deceitful. God killed him on the spot. They didn't give him a chance. Who didn't give him a chance? Peter didn't give him a chance to mount his defense. But more importantly, God didn't give him an opportunity to mount a defense. Why didn't God? We keep talking about how merciful he is and how graceful he is. Why didn't he? Because he wanted y'all to know it ain't going to go down like this. I don't put up with this. And back then in the first century, that church is trying to get going. 
He said, oh, you're going to put everything together the right way, the way I tell you. He may not strike us down in death, physical death today, that quickly, but you better believe he'll bring us back down off our high horse in one way or the other. And if it's not through us, it'll come down through the family one way or the other. We need to be mindful of the God we serve, who he is, and how he rules and how he reigns. And so uh, Ananias was being deceitful. And um, you and I have heard it said that fear, if you fear, then you're not being faithful. Well, sometimes there's things that scare us so much that we actually do become unfaithful in our faith because we allow that fear to consume us. But then there's times like this where it says the people were fearful after they heard what had happened. These people have this reaction to it. Uh, it may have been limited just to those church people, but other people who lived in the community, I'm sure they heard what happened too, and they were all afraid. Well, what was they afraid of? Scripture doesn't tell us that the people yelled, that was wrong, that was injustice. They shouldn't have killed him. People weren't yelling that. They were all struck, fearful, respectfully fearful of God's wrath. We ought to be fearfully and respectfully fearful of God's wrath, okay? So Jesus made it clear we must be careful how we give because why? The glory belongs to him. He wants to make sure you understand. I see you giving. That's my glory. It's not yours. Stop trying to steal my show. That's the God we serve. It's all about him. So whatever we possess, we uh, will do ourselves good to remember he has given it to us. And we are stewards. We're not owners. We only think we are. We don't own nothing. We don't even own our own bodies. Let me tell you something. If you did, you'd never be sick, right? Because nobody wants to be sick. You don't own your own bodies. It's by the grace of God. And we need to be better stewards even of our own bodies. So we must use what he gives us for his glory and his glory alone. Verses 7 through 11. About three hours later. Oh, about three hours later, his wife comes in. She doesn't know what happened. She's expecting to come in there and uh, see that her husband is being praised upon for turning in all of this money and everything because that's what she saw when Barnabas uh, laid his money before the apostles' feet and the people praised him. She thought that's what she was going to walk in on and see taking place with her husband, but that's not what happened. She probably even thought she was going to get a little grace too, but that is not what happened. And Peter, just like he did with Ananias, he jumped in her face real quick, up front, didn't bite his tongue. He asked her one question, is the money he turned in all that you had? Is the money what he said to be true? Did I read all of this to y'all? I didn't read the scriptures. Let me go back and read the scriptures really quick. It says three hours later, she came. She didn't know what happened. Peter asked her, tell me this. Is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? He said to her, how can you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Now, she too was struck down instantaneously. So what happened to her? Three hours went by. She had no idea what happened to her husband, okay? So, but Peter confronted her immediately when she came in three hours later, and he asked her that one question. Is the price quoted by Ananias true? She had a chance to be honest. He asked her a question. Was the selling price true? Sadly, her story matched her husband's. That confirmed that she and her husband acted together in full knowledge and full approval of how they was going to handle that transaction. So they made this mistake of wanting to be esteemed, maybe. We don't know. The scriptures don't really tell us. We can only guess. And we can spend hours and we can waste a whole lot of time 
trying to figure out why they did what they did. Did they do it to be seen? Did they do it to gain glory? Did they do it to get praise? But the Bible tells us when you seek the praise of men, that's all the praise you're going to get. We don't know. Therefore, just as Peter wasted no time telling them that they were wrong and they had to die for it, we ought not waste time trying to figure out God. It'll never work. We can't do it, but we need to devote a whole bunch of time of trying to get to know who he is in our lives, okay? So this is the thing. This couple in the story, they tempted the spirit of the Lord. Maybe they didn't recognize they did that, but we need to be in prayer. Sister Yvonne says she's going to have a little talk with Jesus. We need to have a little talk with Jesus. Ask him to show us when we are tempting the spirit wrongly god that answers those people more sensitive to it but you have to want it well see we can never tempt god with evil and expect him not to do anything we can't expect him to fail at disciplining his own people it's just not going to happen he's going to discipline us one way or another there's no failure in God, you see. The failure is always in us. So here's a key truth. The Holy Spirit uses his power to guide the church in holiness. The, what did I say to you? The Holy Spirit uses his power to guide the church in holiness. We are the church. Verse 11 says, great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is what we, the church of today, can learn from all of this. Number one, God looks at man's heart. He sees what man can't see and thereby he judges. So we are wise not to be hypocritical in our worship, in our service and in our giving. Number two, what the people witnessed gave clear warning that hypocrisy has grave consequences. Number three, the power of God. He gives and he takes away. This alone should be enough to encourage us to respect and honor him at all times and in all circumstances, no matter how bad they might be. No one seemed to question that God had acted in a powerful, judicious way. They didn't question that at all. Number four, God blesses those who give willingly. Proverbs 11, 25 says this, the generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. Another way of saying that is this, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others, they'll be refreshed also. And still another way to look at it is this. He who gives will never be without. I'll tell you, God is in the replenishing business. We don't have to worry about giving up nothing. Now, here's the summary for these last uh, 11 verses. This is how I summarized it. Barnabas in selling his land and giving the full proceeds to the apostles, encouraged all who aspired to be generous. Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira terrified all who believed they could fool God and the church with false worship and lies. That's how I, that's what I got out of all of that. In conclusion, this lesson title is sharing love but it could have easily been titled holiness versus hypocrisy this business it was in the first century church it still is in the 2020 21st century church faith don't mesh well with God and his people. When we individually choose to do things our own way, we hinder the church body. But when to lead us, we will be genuine and generous in giving. We won't be sly and we won't be deceitful like the couple in the lesson. And so I want to encourage us by saying it's not always about sharing the green dollar bill. It's about being genuine in our speech. It's about being real in our actions like Barnabas was. I can give you an example now how I experienced this week a shared love. I'm telling you my own personal experience. On Sunday evening, a church member gave me a call 
call and she says, I've been thinking heavy about you. And during our conversation, she shared how grateful she was that God allows her, not allowed, but allows her to look out from a window in her home to see the beauty of his grass, not the grass in her yard, his grass, her It's testimony. It was testimony to me as how resurrection of power of Jesus Christ is working in her life. See, despite the fact that she is still mourning the loss of a loved one, she has the awesome wonders of the creator on her mind. It leading and empowering her to show compassion and concern for other people and not to pity herself. It's God's spirit that empowers. It's his spirit that sustains. It's his strength that will never lose its power to continue to equip his people to do the work he has called each and every one of us to do, which is to lift the name of Jesus Christ in a way that invites God to come in unto him, self, for the purpose of expanding the kingdom here on earth. The heavenly kingdom, that is. So if the Church of Pleasant Grove Baptist, Springfield, Illinois, truly wants to expand its godly work and presence, then it, I'm talking about the church body, must voluntarily lift holy hands. Let Jesus wash them with the humble spirit. Sit down and let Jesus wash the dirt of the world from their feet. Open deceitful hearts and let Jesus surgically remove anything that's not like him. It's then and only then that the church will be known before others as believers who are of one heart and one soul. That's what shared love is. That goes for every other local church. I just happen to be a member of Pleasant Grove. I ain't beating up on us. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. So be encouraged to take the time to see where and how the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is working in your life. And then go tell somebody about it. That's how the Christian community shares love. We tell somebody about Jesus Christ and his resurrection power. When we love this way, we live out the words in the song the choir sang this past Sunday morning. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's family. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of one body. It is God's will that imply you are important to me. I need you to, to survive. Here's the thing, you all. With God, all things are possible. When a church comes together in one mind and spirit, the Holy Spirit leads the way, empowering the church to do the things God has called it to do. Would you please pray with me? So Heavenly Father, oh, how we need thee, not just for today, but in every hour that you gift us with, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for this lesson that teaches us to forsake not the gathering of believers, Father, and to be in one mind and have one spirit. Help us to be like-minded in all ways, Father, loving you, loving each other. Forgive us when we attempt to deceive you, whether it be by commission or omission, dear Heavenly Father. We don't intend to do that. We know better, dear Heavenly Father. Help us, Father, to generously seek to encourage one another. It's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. It. Amen. And that's our lesson for tonight. Um, I think it is now 